Welcome to television. We're going to talk about television today. Television, yet another new medium. And what happens anytime we introduce a new medium? We talk about our famous frame, that technological innovation leads to increasing democratization of information as influenced by the role of regulation and the role of the market. <clears throat> Excuse me while I take a little sip of water. That was a long one. <clears throat> so let's break that down a little bit. What was the technological innovation with television? It was the invention of the cathode ray tube. That allowed images to be able to go along with the audio. We already had radio. Radio brought audio into the home. People who spoke to you through a little box that you kept in the kitchen or the living room. And they told you about the world and they told you dramas and they told you all sorts of things. But you know, uh, much as people say that radio was great because it sparked imagination, you know, you'd watch, you'd listen to, uh, you know, Stella Dallas, the big serial drama, daytime type serial on radio, and you would imagine what Stella Dallas looked like and you'd hear the sound effects and you, all that would take place in your head. But he said, boy, everybody's, you know, nobody's going to want those visuals. After all, the audio sparks personal imagination. Well, guess what? The minute they were given an opportunity to see what Stella looked like and actually watch the show, television just took off like crazy. Television was a tremendous technological innovation. <clears throat> but as we see with any new medium that comes along, first what happens is everybody's in the existing business is scared. Oh my goodness, what's going to happen? All of a sudden there's this new medium. It's going to drive us out of business. Newspapers were panicky when radio came in. <clears throat> Some people insisted that radio was going to drive newspapers out of business. It didn't drive them completely out of business, but it did mean that they had to change. They had to adapt. They had to find their niche, their space within the spectrum of media products that people wanted to consume. Uh, there used to be six, seven, eight, nine, ten newspapers even in a small town, and they'd publish at different times of the day. Well, that market shook out once radio came in because all of a sudden they had some competition and they weren't able to dominate the market as they had before. There were things that radio did better. They could bring you instant news. If there was a huge explosion of the gas plant across town, <clears throat> radio could tell you about it right now. The moment they found out about it, there was no delay in getting a story typed up, getting it onto the presses, getting those papers printed, getting those papers distributed. It was a much more instantaneous medium, and that changed everything. At the same time, we have to look at, the, again, the role of the market. Uh, you know, do people want it? What will they pay for it? How expensive is it? How do you sustain that kind of business? The role of government regulation. We know that broadcast media is regulated differently than print media is. In the Constitution, newspapers are a very special protected class, and television and radio don't have those same protections. They can be censored and regulated more by the government, and especially because bandwidth is limited. We learned with radio, bandwidth is limited, so the government owns the airways in public trust for us. And they spin off those licenses and allow companies to do that in order to be able to transmit over the airwaves. But the government owes those airwaves so they can regulate more of the content. Now, if we think about it, the old definition of television was it is a form of telecommunication <clears throat> for the transmission of transient images or fixed or moving objects. Yeah, well, I guess that definition still pretty much holds. What we see with media, however, is that one of the things, this is a picture of Guy Kawasaki. Guy Kawasaki, was, uh, he was called the chief evangelist for Apple under Steve Jobs. Uh, interesting guy. He's since then created the website Mashable, very successful. He's an author of a number of books. He coaches a lot of new media companies. But there's that old phrase about how, <coughs> <coughs> what business are you really in? As media tries to sort itself out, they have to realize what business are they really in. You know, railroads, for example. If you thought of yourself as a company that well, you were a railroad and you took only goods and services from point A to point B across a track with an engine, well, that meant that if you had a competitor that came after you and all of a sudden that wasn't the best way to distribute goods, such as when in the Eisenhower administration they built all those highways, and trucks started delivering things, it put a lot of pressure on the transportation business. They were all in the transportation business together. And if the railroad company thought of itself as a transportation comp company, <clears throat> maybe they expanded into trucking. Maybe they changed and found a different model for their work. 
Kawasaki talks about, for example, if you started out and you were the guy that chipped the ice out of the pond, right, and you sold it to your neighbors to be able to keep their food cold, well, if you thought of yourself as an ice harvester, once the new idea of having an ice box came in, they didn't need you so much because there were factories producing that ice, chipping it up into blocks, uh, selling it to people. <clears throat> And then if you realize that your real business was in keeping people, keeping, not people, keeping food cold, well, then that gave you an opportunity perhaps to be the people that took a look at this new field and realized that there was an opportunity there to put a refrigerator into people's homes, a device that kept the food cold on its own, and that no longer were you in the business of harvesting ice. Your real job was to keep food cold. Well, that's what the media companies had to do. Newspapers had to reinvent themselves when radio came in. Radio had to reinvent itself, and newspapers had to reinvent themselves when television came in. <clears throat> so let's look at a little bit of the trajectory of early television, and I was around to watch it. Uh, my dad worked in a shop in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, when I was five years old in 1949, he bought us our first television set was a huge monster that sat in the living room. I remember jumping off the couch the next day and the TV went out. I'm surprised that I lived to tell the tale. I thought my father would never forgive me that I had killed the television set. <clears throat> Our first television set had a round 10-inch screen that was greenish grayish. That's all you could see. And half the time the transmission would go out in the middle of a show. Um, and it was primarily an urban phenomenon. Uh, you had to be able to have either rabbit ears on top of the television or an antenna on the roof to be able to pull in the signal that came from the transmission tower. If you lived 20 miles out of town, that was too far. You weren't able to get those signals. One of the things that we realized that the increasing democratization of information from new technologies has meant is that computers now mean that people in rural areas can be just as slick and sophisticated and up-to-date with what's happening as people who lived in urban areas. Now, in the old days, that wasn't the case. When television came in, you had a tremendous advantage. You could see what was happening. You could see Elvis. When Elvis first hit television, wow, that was a big deal. If you lived in the country, you had no clue what was going on. <clears throat> the very big difference between rural and urban sensibilities as a result of access to media. The invention of coaxial cable allowing various um, networks, the building a network a transmission network where you could have nationally produced shows, just as we saw with radio, where originally it was urban areas, the radio signal went to the urban areas first, but then they were able to put together networks, started to lead to national 15-minute news broadcasts. Uh, we see that content developing. But the challenge for this medium was that there wasn't enough content at first. They didn't know what to put on, just as radio was really, everybody tried to figure out what to do with radio when it first came on board. There was a test pattern during the day. You'd get up in the morning and there'd be the test pattern on television. <clears throat> and except on the weekends, it might be until five or six o'clock in the evening before there'd be any content, before there'd be any shows. And the first ones would be local shows, locally generated shows. Uh, that the affiliates would put on. They might be part of a national network, but they would be putting on their local programming, you know, Cousin Bob and his little fun farm family and animals and kid shows and cooking shows and how to tie flies to go fishing. Uh, uh, when my dad bought that television set in our community, uh, we were one of the first to have a television set, so he'd set up chairs in the living room and invite people over. They'd come over, and they'd watch the test pattern for a half hour, fascinated, before the shows would come on in the evening so that people would have an, and they couldn't afford their own television set, so they'd come over and watch what was going on on ours. But take a look at the growth, <coughs> the dramatic growth in um, the number of how fast television began to penetrate the market. 1946, you had 20,000 sets. Just four years later, you had seven million. I mean, that's a huge difference. Again, they were still clustered in urban areas, but we see how popular television was. It was such a compelling medium that people immediately, if they had an opportunity to do so, wanted to be able to watch what was on television. So it was a huge success. But again, as with radio, the first sales were of the gizmos. Um, the sets, that was where the money was to be made, creating the television sets for sale. It was as they began to realize that sustaining it, just as with radio, meant paying for that content was advertising. The real moneymaker and the real economic driver for television was the advertising dollars. 
So what you saw were things like shows that were sponsored by one sponsor for the entire hour. They had an opportunity to really drive home their advertising message. <clears throat> Comedy shows were big. Martin and Lewis had had a very successful uh, sort of lounge act, comedy act that they took on tour from New York to Las Vegas to Los Angeles and uh, major cities. And when they went on television, they were hugely popular and they were sponsored by Colgate, Colgate products. <coughs> Ozzie and Harriet. Again, Ozzie and Harriet had made the transition. Ozzie Nelson and his wife, uh, the singer Harriet Hilliard, had been a, he had been a big band leader. She was the singer. They went across country. Uh, when radio came along, first they had a show featuring their music, but then they had these kind of two cute kids, and they turned into a little family comedy, and it was the Ozzie and Harriet, the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet on the radio. Very easy to translate that into television success. They were attractive, personable people, and they used their own kids in the show. I Love Lucy, uh -huh. Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball, brilliant business people in addition to being this comedic talent, this wonderful couple that was so entertaining. They again had been sort of nightclub and then she had been a film star and they were smart. They owned their, they formed Desilu Productions. They owned the content. Oh, huge. They began to realize that TV networks were not too bright at first and didn't realize that what they really needed to be focusing on was owning that content. So the I Love Lucy series was owned by Desilu and it was in syndication for years. It made an absolute fortune. And that was where the real money was to be made because people, it would attract eyeballs. And if it attracts eyeballs and you can sell advertising around it, that was a great model. The other mainstay in early television in the 1950s were considered the golden era of television for the most part, the 50s and 60s. <clears throat> were dramas, 60 to 90 minute live dramas on television, Broadway playwrights, young actors like Paul Newman who were trying to find a foothold on Broadway were willing to do a little television. And there was some tremendous, Patty Chayefsky, the playwright wrote for television. <coughs> lots of great productions were put on, lots of young directors had an opportunity to hone their chops on television. Uh, they went on to do great things in Hollywood and also on television in the future. Uh, at first, television was considered sort of the ugly stepchild, you know, the one that you, ooh, if I was a real Hollywood director, I didn't want to do TV. So it was young people who filled that void and a lot of young talent was created in the live television productions. Live was the operative word, though. I mean, that was sometimes a challenge. I remember watching a murder mystery on the TV series Climax one night, and the guy was shot in the first act, and I don't think the actor realized that the camera had pulled back, right? And you could still see him on the ground. He decided to crawl off the set. You know, his part was done. He had been killed without realizing, of course, that he ruined the entire drama on live TV because you could see the dead guy crawling off the set. A lot of that early television is simply lost to us completely. There were no easy ways to make copies of what was going out live over the airwaves, so some just escaped without a copy ever being made. Now, sometimes they made what were called kinescopes. That was basically taking a film of a live television production, just filming the camera, you know, the TV set itself as it was flickering in the camera screen there. Crappy quality, but where they did make some kinescopes, but a lot of those kinescopes were lost. Uh, people either, you know, destroyed them, lost them. Uh, things were taped over when tape became more popular. So unfortunately, a lot of early television history is lost as a result of not having the technology to be able to make those kinds of copies. <clears throat> One of the bigger technological changes, again, that made everybody who owned a black and white TV feel they had to throw theirs out and buy a new one was the invention of color TV in the early 1960s. Uh, made a huge difference. Uh, television didn't transition as easily to color as it might have. I mean, th there would be some shows in color, some shows still in black and white. Uh, it was not a smooth and seamless transmission transition because color television is, uh, with new technology, very expensive, uh, both for your television set to be able to accept color transmission, but also for the gear to be able to send signals in color. 
Um, this was at a time where there was some reflection on the role that television was increasingly playing in the culture. And I wanted to introduce you to a quote about the vast wasteland of television that was uttered by FCC Commissioner Newton Minow. There was a lot of discussion in uh, intellectual circles about whether television was cheapening the culture and it was really reducing, dumbing down of America, the idiot box. Uh, people were going on saying, you know, the, I remember a family that I grew up with, uh, uh, the woman became mayor of our town and her family was very proud of the fact that they never owned a television set and said they never would because they felt that it was so uh, cheapened the culture and did not do good things for people. Minow's argument was that it was really an opportunity. Television is an, had a tremendous potential, but it wasn't always being realized. And I think we see that with each media as it comes along. It is hailed at the beginning as being this tremendous, wonderful new opportunity to, it's going to solve everything and, you know, be as good as sliced bread and solve every technological problem that we have. And it doesn't come quite to that level, but it may not be quite as bad as people say. <coughs> People, you know, it is an opportunity to learn about the wonderful world around you, but it is also a possibility to just sit there for hours and watch reruns of Gilligan's Island, which was what Newton Minow was worried about. Now, there's a court case we need to know about. We're talking about the role of government regulation. Um, when television originally came around, the Hollywood studios had no intention of ever selling their movies to television because they thought, oh, that would be a disaster. It would devalue the value of the movies they had locked away in those vaults. Every once in a while, every few years, they might send those movies out again to the theaters and they draw big audiences because there's with pent up demand while people wanted to see them. But then they began to realize, well, maybe we could sell it to TV. People will sit down, watch it for one night. It's a big deal. We can make a fortune. The TV networks are willing to pay us a lot of money to be able to show these movies. And after all, people can't keep a copy, so it's no big deal. There's still going to be the value in the scarcity of that commodity. Well, then they invented the VCR and the Betamax. Sony's Betamax was a lot better quality than the VCR, but because it was more expensive, it didn't win out the battle to have the largest market share. But what happened is that the movie studios were now showing their films on television, but instead of people just watching it that night and like ephemera, it just goes poof, they were able to make a copy. They could watch it whenever they wanted to. The TV networks didn't have to pay again to show it again to that person because that person had their own copy. They could take that copy and they could loan it to Aunt Tilly and Aunt Tilly could watch it for free. And the TV networks and the studios didn't make any money on that. So Universal, one of the movie studios, sued Sony and said, hey, you really, you're really you stealing our copyrighted material. You're allowing people to make a copy that they haven't paid for. And we deserve a cut of that. It should either be that there is a fee charged on each tape when it's sold and that fee comes to us because you're stealing our copyrighted material or you should have to negotiate a contract with us and pay us an amount of money to be able to allow people to have theft of our stuff. <clears throat> now, I'm not sure that the decision would come down the same today by the same by today's Supreme Court. I think they might be more heavily into protecting the copyright of the studios. But in that era, they decided in favor of the VCR and the Betamax. They said, mm -mm, new technology. They're not making perfect copies. In fact, by the time you dupe a copy two or three times, you could barely see it with those old VHS tapes. And that people had a right to do what's called time shifting. <clears throat> Most people were just using it because they couldn't be home at 8 o'clock that evening to watch the movie and they wanted to be able to see it so they made a copy and maybe they may have watched it when they got home at 10 o'clock. And so the Supreme Court decided against the movie studios and in favor of the new technology. So look at the role government played. They could have literally sort of killed off this whole new medium in its, you know, in its cradle if it hadn't been for that decision. So that again is the role of government. Now let's take a look at, you know, one of the things that television does so well is that it does transmit news. The bulk of the news that people consume in the United States, they get from television. And that's still the case. It's been the case for decades now. That is where we get the bulk of our news. We don't get it from newspapers. Uh, it's increasingly on the internet, but it is television. That is where if something big happens, we go to television and that's where we watch. <coughs> and it can be the evening newscasts. <coughs> <coughs> it can be documentaries. 
In the 1950s, there was Harvest of Shame. Edward R. Murrow put out a TV documentary about the plight of migrant workers in the United States who were being exploited and abused and almost held in virtual slavery. And it, well, there was outrage. Uh, there was demand of reform on the part of the government to take better care of the people who were picking our food. And it was as a result of documentaries that were shown on television. News magazines like 60 Minutes, interview shows, morning news shows, tabloid TV, fake news shows. We've now seen the handoff from Jon Stewart to Trevor Noah. Um, this is a mainstay, a staple in our society. In fact, the most informed people are the ones who tend to watch the fake news shows um, even more than the real news shows in terms of getting information about what's happening. Look at that decline, however, in network evening news, the big three. If you take a look at the kinds of ads that you're going to see on the NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt, that's not going to be stuff aimed at your age group, not at your demographic, not for young people in their 20s. It's going to be Depends, right? It's going to be Dentu Cream. Uh, they realize that that's an aging audience. That is an audience that is getting older and older, and there's some concerns about whether television is in a bit of decline as a result of increasing competition from new news outlets. So which, where, which, uh, where do you get your TV news from? If TV is still the biggest part of the marketplace, where do you get your news from? Uh, we also think about how you can package television and repackage it and repurpose it and online now. Hulu, for example, has as its model taking sort of used television shows and repackaging them for people to watch later and charging a subscription fee to do so. Netflix and Amazon Prime have added to that wrinkle, and they're sort of more like cable television in the sense that what they've done is that they're now starting to do original programming, House of Cards on Netflix, um, Transparent uh, on uh, uh, Amazon Prime. These are shows that are created original programming where you have to have a subscription to that computer show. I mean, yeah, the show that you're going to watch on your computer. So what's the difference between cable television programming and programming on the Internet? It gets a little bit fuzzy as we begin to see these platforms start to converge. So what we see is that in addition to the free broadcast network transmissions, cable television is trying to and still struggling to sort of figure out its niche. It is a monopoly. Being able to invest that much and the cable that it takes to be able to get you that programming is very expensive. So communities are able to are allowed to grant a monopoly to one company. You know, they'll say, OK, Comcast for Lansing, you own us. You know, we we'll, won't let any competitors come in. Uh, we're going to shut them out of this business because we'll let you have the monopoly so that you guarantee that you will make the investment in the infrastructure to be able to give us cable television. It took a long, long, long time to get cable television in New York City because of that reason. Very expensive investment in infrastructure. Lots of companies wanted to compete for that valuable license. <clears throat> but we now see cable companies bundling up. They're going to offer you things like your cable modem. I'm out in the country, so uh, I get my cable TV, I get my cable modem, and I get my VoIP, Voice Over Internet Protocol, Internet Telephone, over one package. If I pull one of those pieces out, I may not actually save any money because by buying them bundled together, I get a certain kind of discount. We also see a rise in community media. Public access media, it used to be that if a cable company was granted exclusive access to a community, they had to have a studio where people could go in and put on their own local programming. Um, this was very big in New York City. People had public access television shows. I had a public access television show in East Lansing for three years. It was a lot of fun. Had a weekly show that was on there. <clears throat> we now see Comcast in Lansing. They have the community media model, and they have public media where they have a one channel devoted to local programming and a website where they have a lot of original programming that comes on there. <coughs> Cable television varies from having sort of the basic cable where you don't, you know, they're still advertising on CNN to generate revenue. It's not just fees. All the way up to premium channels like HBO where you pay enough per month that they don't have to have any advertising. Um, they started out <coughs> with some original programming themselves, first doing specials, music, and then comedy. And then they started their own pictures. You know, they started, they put on the Sopranos. They, you know, when the Godfathers kind of morphed into the Sopranos. Uh, all of a sudden, HBO changed the ballgame with a lot of this original programming. HBO documentaries, very big, an important new source of revenue for them. People want to watch documentaries. 
Um, we have these cable series now, different kinds of series that are offered of original programming and a lot of these main cable companies, the premium channel networks. And they're under pressure as we see more and more challenges from the Internet. We'll talk about that when we move into computers. So what is the future? Is television and the Internet, are they going to converge? Are people going to be able to watch shows in all on all platforms at all times? Uh, we see Chromecast. We see Apple TV. Um, there are all sorts of opportunities now for you to do what amounts to your own cable programming on YouTube. You can webcast your own show as a YouTube live event and basically have your own television channel but have it on YouTube. It's getting fuzzy. We don't know where all the lines are anymore. It's difficult to keep track of. So what is really TV and what is computer and what is internet and what's on the phone? Um, the question is the money. <clears throat> what's going to support bringing you all of this content, whether it's storytelling, whether it's news, whether it's current events? Uh, Facebook has just announced that it's going to go after TV ad revenue big time because look at the ad revenue potential. Digital ad spending is predicted to be 15 billion by 2019. Okay, that's a lot of money. But television ad spending is predicted to be 74 billion by 2019. 74 billion. Wow, that's a lot of money. That's uh, quite a bit. So that explains why Facebook wants to target some of that advertising revenue and make sure that they can get a larger chunk of it. Facebook has certain advantages. They have 1.5 billion users, okay? And they can target a niche audience. They can say, we can send this uh, ad targeted to women 18 to 34 years old who live in urban areas, who work in high-paid professional jobs. That's not something that television can do. Television can't be that specific in its target audience. So how is television going to survive? How is it going to compete? Facebook is also brilliantly organized already to deal effectively with phone platforms, which is where young people are getting so much of their information. Television isn't quite as ready yet, and it hasn't done as good a job in integrating itself into that new mobile environment. <clears throat> Facebook can make that television experience on your phone more interactive by saying, okay, now take a poll and tell us what you think about this, or tell us in real time what you think about this. Television is starting to do that. We're seeing some of that with stations like MSNBC, but they kind of experimented with polling every once in a while, and then they pull it in. It doesn't seem to work very well. <coughs> it may work better online. Webcasting is becoming huge. Nobody knows exactly where that's going to go. Will we be able to watch our webcasts on our television or only on our computers? Will we be able to watch Hulu only on our computers or will it be available on our television screens? Are computers just better at delivering this kind of information or different? How is television and what is it going to be its niche? And uh, what's going to happen is we see all these technological advantages with all sorts of high-def screens and all sorts of different kinds of technological innovations that make television uh, so beautiful nowadays where you can literally have a whole screen on your wall, curved screens, uh, for uh, you know, a 4K television, 4K video. So the technology is an important piece of this, and it's not completely clear where all of this is going to uh, end up. So part of the challenge in looking at the history of any new medium is remembering that frame. What are the commercial underpinnings that are going to keep bringing us that content? We have things like public television, which is WKAR right here in our building as a public television station. And that is supported by donors, but it's also supported by the government. And there are a lot of people who feel that that's not something that the government should be doing, that television should be a free market situation and it should not be supported by tax dollars. There are others who say that's a perfectly valid function of government is to support that kind of public education, especially things like Sesame Street, which did so much to bring literacy to children in rural areas who might not have had access to that kind of programming if it hadn't been for the opportunities for public television to do so. It's just too hard to compete against, you know, all of the sugary cereal commercials and so forth. Um, we know that television can be a real force for good or it can be a force for evil. Well, we've had to regulate television in terms of what we do allow TV to be able to do for uh, and to children on those Saturday morning cartoons. Um, you know, putting all of those images so quickly at kids, bam, 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 
lots of visuals. Research is showing that it may be reducing children's attention span, which is why the American Society of Pediatrics is suggesting that you don't park your child in front of the television set um, for if they're under five years old, because you can literally be rewiring their brains. We do see that there's been a rise in, in concerns about things like ADHD at the same time that we have seen a rise in children's television and youngsters who have watched television at an early age. Is there a correlation there that we should be concerned about? Uh, we want the role of government to step in and say that you cannot just deceive kids and you cannot overly bombard kids with too many commercials on a Saturday morning that it's not healthy for their little growing minds. Um, so we want government to step in and make sure that what we're seeing is real. The quiz show scandals again, where it's a disaster to think that, you know, people were lied to and that they trusted television to be honest and real. We see now with reality TV, for example, nice, cheap programming, easy to put on, but a lot of it is hyped and there's some potential dangers and downsides in these things. We may not be like Newton Minow, viewing it as a vast wasteland, but what should TV be doing? How, what role should it play in a democratic society? What role should it play in the overall mix of media that we as individuals put together for our own media diet? Uh, television. Now that's the last great new medium before the advent of the internet and the computer and that will be the next kind of new medium that we will be looking at. But now we're going to take a look at a video on one of the TED Talks from a TV executive talking about how if you look at the history of television you also see that it talks about the American conscience that analyzing the content of what television has brought us through the decades helps us understand what we cared about, what our values were. Whether we like it or not, media tells us as much about who we are as we tell, we use it as a source to learn about ourselves. <clears throat> we don't always see in real time how we are actually being reflected, but we can look back historically and see what's happened with these various media over the years, and it gives us a record of who we were at a specific point in time. So let's take a look at that TED Talk and find out what's happening with the new medium of television.